Hello everyone and welcome to our service for Sunday the 6th of December. I hope you're all well and now that we're in the countdown to Christmas that you're getting everything organised for the 25th. Just two announcements. One, a reminder that for those of you who are hoping to come in person to our Carols by Candlelight services, we're doing two services, both identical but on different nights so that we can spread out everyone who wants to come. So the first one is the 19th of December at 7 o'clock. That's Saturday the 19th of December at 7 o'clock. And the other one is Sunday the 20th of December at 7 o'clock in the evening as well. If you wish to come along, please do call Coastline and leave a message or email us uh, on the church website and we'll get you booked in for that. Booking is essential for it as we expect it to be busy. And a big thank you to the worship team for all the hard work they're doing and the run-up to Christmas. Also, just to announce that we're still doing our drop-ins on Fridays. That'll keep going and probably until the last uh, Friday before Christmas. Then we'll take a break over the Christmas period. But the drop-in is from 11 to 3, and you're more than welcome to pop along without any bookings for a cup of tea, some prayer, and support. Let us pray, and we'll press on with our service. Lord, we thank you for this new day. As always, we're grateful for it. Great is your faithfulness that sees us through the night watches and gives us new mercies in the morning. As we hear your word opened and read, would you be with us? And would the hope that we hear fill our hearts? And as we hear your worship sung, may it fill our hearts, our minds and our souls. And may we indeed be lost in wonder, awe and praise of the one who was promised to come as our saviour and as the light that shines in the darkness. In his name we pray. Amen.
Both our readings today are coming from Isaiah, and they're out of order, but the first one is from Isaiah 40, verses 25 to 31. And it's just a reminder, as we come to Christmas, that the promised Messiah we'll hear about shortly is the one who comes and gives us strength and renews us. Isaiah 40, verse 25 and following. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. Who brings out the stars by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might? And because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you speak, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, that my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creators of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His wisdom is and understanding are unsearchable. He gives power to those who are panting. And to him who has no might left in himself, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary. Young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint.
Our second reading comes from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. But with this one, you'll not see the text appear on the screen as the translation is one that has been written by Alec Mote, a famous commentator on Isaiah, and I think he captures the text beautifully. So please just listen along to the text. But there will be no darkness for the one who experienced distress. Round about that former time he brought dishonour to the land of Sebulun and the land of Naphtali. And later he determined to bring it on her, the road by the sea around the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who were walking in the darkness have seen a great light. Those living in a land as dark as death, light has flashed out upon them. You have multiplied the nation. To it you have brought great rejoicing. They rejoice before you like rejoicing at the harvest, just as they exult when they share out spoil. Because the yoke which burdened them, and the stick across their back, the cudgel of the taskmaster over them you have shattered like the day of Midian. Because every boot that tramps in the ruck, and clothed rolling in blood, will be consigned to burning, fodder for the fire. Because a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us, and the princely rule has been set on his shoulder, and he has been called Wonderful Counselor, Warrior God, Father in perpetuity, Prince of Peace. To the increase of princely rule and of peace, there is no limit. On David's throne and over his kingdom, making it secure and sustaining it in judgment and righteousness. From now on and forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Thanks be to God. Cynicism, world weariness, sarcasm, wit, it can be funny. Uh, I think of Oscar Wilde's famous uh, wit, I'm sure you've all heard of, about how he loves all of mankind, it's just people he has a problem with. And we laugh because we know Wilde's personality, he was a bit of a recluse in some ways, and we get the cynicism in it. But cynicism that's refounded after years and years of hopelessness, is a very different kettle of fish, isn't it? And when we come to the prophecies of Isaiah, one of the most majestic books in the whole of Scripture, Isaiah is a powerful, powerful book. It has been described as the fifth gospel because of its clear picture of Jesus. It's been described as the Bible in miniature. All of its 66 chapters seem to parallel major themes in Scripture. The heights of its rhetoric in Isaiah 6 as we look at the majestic holy, holy, holy the Lord God Almighty, the vision in the temple, down to the pathos and emotion 
of Isaiah 53 about the servant who is wounded for our transgressions. It has everything. And it was written to a people who had the hope grounded out of them, who were cynical, who were weary, who just wanted a bit of peace and not bothered, and had given up living and given up dreaming and giving up hoping. And so we come to Isaiah 9, where it starts off about the people here in darkness. Uh, some translations say, she who is in gloom. The idea of gloom there sort of really captured it like a dreich, probably those who are in dreichness, we would say, here in Scotland. And they're gloomy. And the lands of their gloomy are Naphtali, Naphtali sorry, and Sebulun. These were the northern borders of Israel, and as all borderlands, uh, we hear about borders in the news at the minute, disruptions and disputations. All borderlands, usually in invasion or war, are the first to be occupied and the last to be liberated. And so those dwelling here in the furthest reaches of the, away from the centre, who have no hope, are told all of a sudden a light will flash upon them. Those dwelling in deep darkness, who experience distress, a light will shine in them. And God will fulfil a promise to Galilee of the nations. God's coming to rescue his people. Light in the Old Testament symbolises the presence of God. Light brings healing, it brings power, it brings wellness and restoration. This light flashes upon those who are gloomy. It floods the whole situation with hope. And hope is the next verse in verse 2 there. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, living in the land as dark as death. The language there comes from Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. That will be fulfilled very powerfully and very intimately in a second. God's light brings hope. It brings joy in verse 3. The nation has increased their rejoicing at the day of harvest when the food is brought in. Great rejoicing. Food for all. The winter supply sorted out. Happiness, joy, hope. Then deliverance. Verse 4. Because the yoke which burdened them the stick, the lash across their back, the cudgel of the taskmaster over and you've shattered like the day of Midian. Midian is that famous scene from Judges verses 68 where Gideon delivers the people. Israel was at its lowest point in the Judges. They were scattered, divided, confused, occupied, brutalized. And God raises up not a mighty man of valor, though he was called that, but outwardly he was a timid man, Gideon. He was so brave that he hid behind the washing machines. And yet God used him and he used 300 men to overthrow an army to show that deliverance doesn't come from man. It doesn't come from politicians. The psalmist tells us, put not your trust in princes. Deliverance comes from God, even against unexpected odds. The God who can do more than we could think, hope or imagine according to the power at work within us. God comes hope, joy and he brings deliverance in a way that will surprise everyone. And because he is God, he can do it. And so verse 5 comes the promise of peace. A peace that will see totalities of war stopped. We live in an age, conflicts, tensions. We have, in my lifetime, I can remember one, two, three, four, five wars. And there's been many more. And I myself grew up in Northern Ireland. That continuous conflict it has an uneasy peace now. All those conflicts, all those tensions in the South Seas, Every boot that tramps in the ruck, every clothing that's covered in blood, will be burned up. God will bring total, universal peace. Why? Where does this light, hope, joy and deliverance and peace come from? Well, it comes from a promise, verse 6. A promise from God. Isaiah is the beginning of, and perhaps the, with the exception of Daniel, the clearest indications that God would send what the Jewish people called a Messiah, one who would come and save and rescue the people of Israel. And here is a beautiful promise, but it's it's even better. We have to go back to first four to realize that God could do more than we could think or imagine, like the Battle of Midian. But the promised one who's coming is a child. Is it a king? Surely it must be a king like King David, yes. A son is given to us, the prince he rules be set on his shoulder, so he'll be a king. But God has called him. I notice when God calls somebody, God is true. God cannot lie. God will call him the wonderful counselor. No problem will be too great for this king. 
No heartache will be too much for this king. He has unsearchable wisdom, greater than Solomon. Remember that famous scene of Solomon where the two ladies are fighting over the child and Solomon, as wisdom says, cut the child in half, give them a half each, knowing that the true mother would cry out to do anything to spare her child's life. This wonderful counsellor will have greater wisdom and have wisdom to apply it in our lives. Trust not in your own understanding, but lean on the Lord with all your heart. This counsellor is trustworthy and wise. He is the warrior God. Some translations say the mighty God. Moteas translates here as the warrior big God because he acknowledges that there is evil in the world. Evil so much that sometimes our heart break at the thought of it. God will put all that to right. Justice will be established through this promised son who is a king, who is a warrior God. The word there for God is Yahweh. And all of a sudden this takes on a clear meaning. This promise that God has given us is actually himself. Because the next first father in perpetuity means forever. This God, this promise, this one who will come. Now people get confused about this because we have God the Father. How can Jesus be a father? It's the idea of a father who cares, who protects, who provides. Jesus does that. He mirrors his own heavenly father in doing that with us. Prince of peace, prince of shalom, prince of wholeness and wellness. It'll take a few chapters later on Isaiah for us to get a clearer picture of how this peace will be applied. Basically, this promised king who is God, who will come, takes on human flesh and bears our sin and our sorrows so that we can have peace with God and peace with each other. A peace that this promised king will later on say is a peace not the world gives, but a peace as he gives. Hope, joy, deliverance, peace based on a promise and it lasts forever. Verse 7. To the increase of princely rule and the peace, there is no limit. I can't remember the, the, the title of the song that used to be sung, but Like a River Glorious is God's perfect peace. Onward it floweth deeper in its increase. The idea is a river starts out small and tiny, doesn't it? Its source, I mean, some of our mightiest rivers start out like a trickle on a hillside and it grows deeper and fuller and broader. And the idea is that this king, this peace, is like that Ezekiel promised later on around the same time as I have the river that comes out of the temple and fills the whole earth with life. This will be established it will be secure and sustained by God and his seal and passion forever. So for you today who feels you're dwelling in gloom and darkness, a light has shone upon you and that light shines and will never be put out. And those who trust in this promised one will have hope, joy, deliverance and peace because faith in the promises of God is what saves us. Faith in his Messiah, his only son, Jesus Christ. And those promises will hold secure and last forever. Now that's something to lift our cynicism, that's something to lift our weariness and to fill our hearts with joy. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the promises of Isaiah. We thank you that you spoke so clearly and powerfully by your spirit through the prophet and that those words ring true to our hearts today. We thank you that we can see even more clearly than Isaiah did that these promises would find their shape and fulfilment in the man God, your son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ who has brought us hope, who has given us joy, who has delivered us from our sins, who has put us at peace within ourselves and between us and you, and whose promises and whose riches and whose joys and whose salvation lasts forever for those who believe. O oh Lord, we worship and praise you this morning for this good news. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Bye.